All right, folks, welcome to the Gritty Podcast. It has been a minute. Today, I'm sitting down with Ryan Lampers. I just got back from Arizona. I want to talk to him about coos deer. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm before you start. I'm gonna claim there's a lot of luck involved in my in my two consecutive coos deer uh, tags. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't know how you get around um, feeling like you're extremely lucky whenever you are able to put a tag on a coos deer. Um, yeah, there's some skills and strategies, but, uh, gosh, dang, it's, I feel like that of all hunts, you got to have luck on your side. Really? So a hefty dose. Yeah. I mean, whether it's a, like I was lucky that first year, like when you and I went down, when, uh, we hunted together that first time, um, I had wind in my favor. Like I had the noise I had, um, I got really lucky that day, but that buck put himself in a spot. And the wind allowed me to get in tight enough. If it would have been a calm day, that would have been an unlucky day. I wouldn't have filled the tag that day, I believe. So definitely some luck and All right. Well, then share with me, um, you know, you're on this hunt in Arizona. And uh, both times, both both coos bucks, you know, I got to within 40, 45. I got to 45 yards the first time on a cliff, and he was right below me bedded under a tree there's just a too many branches to shoot him i needed him to to stand up i was there for about 30 minutes things were good and then all of a sudden he got a little twitchy a little nervous his head started turning bobbing looking around now you know i was in the rocks i mean if he looked right at me sure he could see me but i was watching him he, he wasn't looking at me He was buried in the brush somehow though he he got up he rebedded he was still twitchy and then he just blew out of his bed and ran down the hill toward toward where his doe was and and uh, mm. and ran away. What what, what happened? Like uh, that's the mule deer in him right there. <laughs> that sixth sense. That's the <laughs> that's why that's why I love chasing coos deer. Uh, not so much ag field whitetail, but coos coos whitetail are at another level. Very similar to a KGL mule deer. Um, man, that's a good question because, uh, who knows? I mean, gosh, it sounds like you were in tight several times and, and did everything right. Like sometimes you just, all you can do is get in tight and, and, and hope that when they stand, they offer up a shot. Sometimes they go the wrong direction, but you would swear with coos deer over anything else that they do have some sort of a sixth sense about them. Um, it's, it's. Yeah, it's bizarre. They the are second, which the second time I got to 40 yards uh, and the buck was bedded behind a tree, but the doe was bedded kind of behind the tree a little bit. And we were on a slope and it was on the same elevation as me. And I was here and there was, it was a series of ridges and I was on the ridge. So I crept over the ridge a little bit and I had a shot um, if the buck was not bedded behind a tree. So I sat there and it was 40 yards to the doe. And I'm, I'm on the ridge now it's a grass ridge and they're under a mesquite tree on a grass ridge as well. So there's a ridge, there's a, there's a can little cut between us, but I'm shooting across the cut to them. You know, um, there's an Okatia near me, but mostly it's just a grass ridge. Now I could have stayed below the ridge and it would have been, you know, I would have had to ease up to get the shot, but I rolled over the ridge just a little bit. It was shadowed, you know, but I, then I sat there for a couple of hours and the sun started to shift. And then pretty soon the sun was just at that angle where it just was beaming on me. And I, the doe had been looking at me for looking in my direction past me chill for a while. I think once that sun hit a certain angle, I was reflective in some way because it was like, instantly she had no doubt that i was not vegetation i was not something that was supposed to be there and i'm in the golden grass it's tall it's taller than it's ever been that since i hunted arizona yeah and they didn't notice me or care until that sun hit the right angle and i i think she didn't smell me that's 100 percent. and then man she blew out of her bed and she stood there for Fifth, 10 minutes just stomping and looking at me and stomping and looking at me and stopping and the buck stood up but he stood up behind a tree mm. and they stood there forever and i'm like dude just take a step just give me a and uh 
finally she'd had enough and and she turned and ran up the mountain and then the buck you just never gave me a good shot i could have taken a shot at like 75 but just it wasn't yeah. a good shot he was loaded and gosh yeah and that's <clears throat> i know we were we were messaging back and forth a little bit while you were down there on that hunt and um you know it feels like if if any if any animal that we chase is gonna pick up shapes and and glare and and just recognize any little thing that's not that's out of place it's coos deer especially those coos bucks or even the coos does for i mean they are they are so sharp and i feel like they know their environment they don't migrate anywhere they they just know their environment so dang well that even just a mound in that yellow grass or the glare from when the sun hits you that's all it takes seeing anything out of place i mean they're they're running from bobcats and everything you know they're just such a small deer um and just so twitchy and so turned on uh i think i think i mentioned to you if there's ever a place where you'd want like a yellow grass ghillie suit it would be down there in az chasing coos deer <laughs> because yeah, yeah it's just it, it breaks up your silhouette so much and you know you don't worry about it as much with elk or things like that or I'll admit even mule deer. Um, but with coos, gosh dang, they they seem to pick up. I mean, even if you're statue, they just seem to pick it up. Just yeah, I, they, I actually had to change my mindset uh as I continued throughout the hunt after being shocked that they busted me because in any other setting with any other animal, I would totally make that move because they look right past you they see movement. They, they don't, they don't know you're there. Um, up in the rocks on a hill like this stationary, like I just can't see how they would see you. Um, any other animal would just look at you and look past you so long as you're not moving. But, um, I'm convinced that, uh, well, I know for sure I had deer coos deer walking along and look at me and they like, Nope, I see you. Like I see you. (laughs) And there is no, (laughs) <laughs> yeah, there is nothing like I would with an elk where I'd set up in front of a tree or a bush and use it as a backdrop. I mean, you're at full draw mm-hmm. on that hunt you were on last year mm-hmm. when you shot that bull with the frontal and that bull comes, dude, when he walks into the clearing and I watch it with friends, you know, and they've seen it for the first time, they're like, is it looking at him? Does it see him? And it looks like he does. The bull's looking mm-hmm. right at you, big old six. And he's just like, and then he kind of glazes past you or his eyes wander. And it's like, no, he doesn't quite see you. And then he walks up the hill and what, you shoot that bull out three yards, three yards, three, four yards. Yeah. Yeah. He came. Now there was a little tree kind of covering my lower half, but my top half was wide open. Like uh, that wouldn't have happened with a coos deer, but it does happen with elk. Um, <laughs> That's what I mean. Maybe, like yeah, but with like with that bull, I mean, he came up and over, and he had heard noise. He had heard some crunching. Um, he was looking for the noise where the noise came from. Um, now we were off ridge and we were down on the downhill slope a little bit, broken up. We had four guys with us too, That's and what I was uh, just gonna say those three guys were right behind me, and so there's like there's two cameras going, and you know a bunch of dudes. And yet that bull did come up. He stopped out there. I think it was 37 yards, kind of scanned the area, looking for what he thought was a cow crunching up the ridge. It was us crunching up the ridge. And then, yeah, he just he just kind of glanced in our direction, and he was heading towards that noise, uh, even though he's looking right at us. And they're just not as aware. Because like I said, that, that, a coos deer is never going to do that. He's never going to look – where you're standing in the wide open and just start coming your direction and not see you. I, I, I've yet to have that happen. Those does are as sharp as any of those mature bucks as well. They're just turned on. And I feel like they're just so small and they're always getting chased by, you know, cats and coyotes and everything. They're just susceptible to that. So that's where I started to think in my mind, okay, you know, normally I would use this cover or this brush um to get in close and to get my shot and i would 
I, you know, normally I would do this, this, and this, but I, I started to change my mindset with coos deer. And I started to say to myself, hunt this, like I'm hunting Brad, hunt this, like I'm hunting Ryan, <laughs> like hunt this, like I'm hunting a human yeah. because it's not okay for me to just use cons- you know, station, be stationary, still use something to break up my background. Wouldn't matter. You guys would look right at me and see me, you know? And I swear that's the, that's how I had to start looking at my close encounters with coos deer. I want you to tell me about that close encounter, you know, as we're talking about getting the full draw on coos deer, how, and, and getting the shot, how, tell me about your first buck and your second buck, Mm -hmm. because Maybe that'll help me. And I've heard the stories before, but refresh my memory. Yeah. I think it might help me understand the proper setup in tight like that. Because you made it happen. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I'll say, I feel like every time there's a little bit of luck involved. uh, I think I've, now there's also the fact that I feel like I put myself in a, in a position where I had the highest likelihood of being able to get full drawn and then take that shot at close range. So, uh, that first year, yeah, you know, I'd been glassing those bucks from a distance. Uh, there was a couple of bucks in there and that, that real good one. Um, and they finally put themselves to bed in a spot that had a lot of little cuts and, and rolls in it. Um, a little bit of, you know, cover some of that oak brush where they like to bed in. And they just happened to put themselves in an area where, um, from a distance, I felt like it had enough terrain features, little rolls that I could get down in tight into the bottom of this drainage. And they were on the opposite side of, and I came in high and I, and I got down in this cut and was able to, um, kind of hide myself from ever being exposed. And I got down to where I felt like when they do get up, this is the natural direction they're going to go. How do, you and, know, um, how do you know that? Cause I, you know, having hunted with you a long time, um, you do have that, uh, instinct to predict where the animal is going to pop out or, or, you know, we'll see a bear wander in and you're like, he's going to come out over here or it doesn't matter really what it is, but you're pretty good at, you know, anticipating what they're going to do next. Like, how do you know, how did you know that? what made you think that was the direction they were in? Had you patterned them days before or is it just general knowledge about deer? I think just watching them, um, you know, watching them as much as, as I had, um, that morning, seeing that they had already come from this certain direction, like the group of those, they weren't going to go back. They were going to keep steady on that, on that contour, on that, that line where they were heading the trajectory. Um, up this drainage. It's a shallow drainage, um, but it goes in a direction. Hmm. And uh, the day before I'd seen, you know, them feeding up in that zone already as well. So I just, I just had a sneaking suspicion. They weren't going to backtrack. They got to this point up mid draw, they bedded down. And I felt like when they were going to get up, they're going to continue on that trajectory up, up drainage. So um, I got above them versus below them. Uh, I could have gone either way for sure. The wind was absolutely perfect in my face and, uh, it went, you know, to my benefit there, but yeah, I was able to get up in that, into that cut and it it wasn't even that long. I, it wasn't even a long wait. Um, they had stood up and started milling around even before I got to the position that I wanted to be in to kind of, um, hunker down. And it was just a little cut, little roller, little uh, kind of dirt bank that gave me the ability to stay concealed, kind of get my eyes on where, you know, I thought they were coming from when they when they were up. And when they got up, the does kind of spread out and started feeding around. Well, one of the does just happened to run right past me, right where I I was hoping and expecting them to go ran right past me at 18 yards, right in front of me. And that was the doe that I thought, well, that buck is not is, going 18 not yards good. is so close to a coos deer. I'd almost feel like you're screwed now. You're screwed yeah. in the, you're too tight. Well, and, and how this was like to paint the picture. So there's a, there's a cut straight in front of me and I am 
perpendicular to that cut and another cut that goes dissects it. Um, and there's a little tree there. And so, you know, until that, that doe got right in front of me, if she would have turned left, she would have seen me, but there was a little tree and she just kept going straight up that little Creek bed. And so I knew, you know, I needed to be that close to get a shot on these, on these little ninjas, but sitting down in that spot on my knees, um, you know, I fully expected that buck to be hot on her tail and, and he was, so he took the same road that she had just taken. Um, she had gotten out of sight and here he came trotting by and that was, I won't forget it because, uh, you know, it's always risky making noises, you know, to stop a deer and then it feel like it's tenfold, um, more risky when you're trying to stop a whitetail or a, a coos deer. And so, you know, thinking about this, having so much time to think about the shot in my head, I knew like, as soon as I start making that noise, I need to be letting that arrow go like it's split second, like quarter second. I need to let that arrow go. And that's what I did. Um, I was fully drawn. I got fully drawn and I was holding that thing for a while. He, here he comes. Yeah, so he kind of goes up, back, up, back. When yeah. did you decide to draw? So I had a little bit of a visual. I could get my head up. Um, there was some yellow grass on the top of this little ridge that I was next to. And so I saw him coming. Um, and I knew he was going to be coming, which is why I kind of looked in that direction. And here he comes and they, it's so cool watching them just at the trot, that rut trot that they do, you know? And so I saw him coming. I saw his rack coming. I kind of, you know, kind of hunkered down just a little bit. And, um, again, this ridge isn't that tall. I'm on my knees and there's, there's a little gap, there's a little tree, and then there's a wide open. And so when he gets you know, to that wide open, which is where I want to take that shot. Um, you know, that's where I need to stop him. And that's where I need to let that arrow go. So he shot right through the first little opening, got behind the tree. I stopped him. As soon as I stopped him, I let that arrow go. And that was an 18 yard shot. And, um, I think I showed you where I ended up shooting that buck. And I, I don't know that we could have been in a better spot because, getting to 18 yards on those things feels like it's mission impossible unless they come to you. Um, yeah. Just sneaking in on a buck that close or even a doe. Gosh, dang. It seems it's just the, the country that, that they're in is so noisy. It's so tough. But again, I had wind in my favor. It was really noisy. Like it yeah. was, it was ripping. Yeah, we So I had the noise covered with the wind. Brad got to, 15 yards on, um, a bunch of deer coos. He had some, I mean, we were able to sneak right up to them this year, yeah. multiple times, 32 yards on a big, you know, he would, we were both in that tight, tight, tight bubble. Um, yeah, close. and normally we would sit back and try to let them come to us, but we did have cover wind. We did have mm -hmm. terrain, and uh, actually, with with a little bit of wind noise, you know, like always, it changes everything. It changes oh, everything. Yeah. And it was a wet year. And so yeah. there was just a lot of moisture in the air, a lot of cloud cover. And it was just every day was stockable. It was a good stockable mm -hmm. day. I've been there with you when you can hear a pin drop from 500 oh. yards. It's just we hear yeah. guys talking, you know, 300 yards away and yeah. a whisper. And you're like, there's dudes up there. So, I mean, I, and, and those little guys, I mean, they'll pick you off from five, 600 yards with ease. Don't expect that, um, at that distance or that range that they're not going to see you because they do, they are yeah. that aware. And, um, once they see that movement, man, I feel like they don't just go back to being normal. They either trot away or they focus on you for 30 minutes and, yeah. uh, continue to watch that area. So you got to 18 yards yep. and you took that yep. shot took that shot right when right when you just like did, did like what a grunt like a bat and then shot. yeah it was just the brain and he was stopping <laughs> i was releasing at the same time nice and close um and that's the thing they're so twitchy um you know i'm not a big whitetail hunter i haven't done a lot of um you know the tree stand stuff that you've done and and all that jazz and blind hunts. I just haven't really gotten into that. So 
knowing how small they are and how jumpy they are, you fully expect them to either dump down a little bit and dodge that arrow potentially. But um, yeah, my whole plan was, and I think it should always be the plan with coos deer is if you do have to stop them, um, you better be releasing that arrow within a half a second of, of them turning their head because they're just going to, they're going to boogie. Yeah. Just that turned on. Yeah. So, so and that's trickier. It, like it's, oh. it's very similar to what happened um, on the next coos deer that I had really nice, close shot, 20 yard shot. Again, um, where I was at behind this boulder, there's a, a valley, a, a saddle that that buck was coming through and I was kind of perpendicular to that. And, um, he came full broadside through the brush on a major trail. And, um, and I got that shot right there. But if you remember with that buck, I didn't hit him where I wanted to hit him. Like he, it ended up being a frontal shot and you know, that buck stopped. He turned, I release, and within that half a second, he had time to spin back towards where he had come from. He's walking left to right. He spun. I had that right behind the shoulder. When I released, he spun and took it full frontal. And that's, that's where that, that's where it put it down. <laughs> At 20 yards, that, that fast. And uh, yeah, I was blown away. Um, because I thought at that range, uh, even though I shoot a heavy arrow, it's, it's pretty fast still. Um, I didn't expect him to go move that fast and and get full frontal like that, but Mm. he did. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, 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 this year I did feel the, that, and I think it was just a a good year for big, big deer, uh, in the desert because we found quite a few especially on the coos deer side, we did find our deer. And the thing that was really interesting I've, I've observed in the desert situations is you and I have hunted in areas where it's crawling with coos bucks all over a mountain range. Yeah, We've gone back in a dry year and there's not a coos deer to be found on the same yeah. spot. Right. And what I've noticed is year over year, it's, it's the moisture and the, and the weather the vegetation plays a huge role in where they congregate just because you have a honey hole one year doesn't mean it's a honey hole next year. Now we're talking extreme desert, you know, really far South Mexican border kind of stuff. Um, or just, just the, the desert that just has no water in it outside, you know, areas like Tucson and so forth. It's like, it's just so dry. I think they, your honey holes shift when it comes to coos deer because yeah they the water makes a huge difference makes all the difference yeah we've talked about that it's you know an area where i felt like i had that feeling like man i think i could come back here for the next 10 years we talked about and, that and daily be stocking coos bucks you know because i love the environment that they were in um it felt like they were always going to be there there was a creek a uh, small creek it had all the cuts and rolls that a spot and stock guy loves to have and combo that with these coos bucks. I felt like, man, this is going to be the ticket. It wasn't crowded with people. Um, perfect spot flash, you know, fast forward, go back there on a dry year last year. I couldn't scratch a doe off of that hillside or that entire drainage. It was absolutely empty. <laughs> Now, it, it, you know, no monsoon season last year equated to no tall grass. Like it was literally dirt. No, where we're looking at three, four, five foot high grass in places on, I think, your average year with a good monsoon season. Last year was down to the dirt. Like you could see everything. Um, and so there was no places to hide. Water was really, really scarce. And uh, I think the lack of nutrition brought a rut that just wasn't very strong like i feel like they weren't cruising like you usually see bucks just coos and mule deer bucks just you know running ridges looking for does last year's uh 
conditions. We just never saw that. We, yep. we saw a rut action. It was limited and it wasn't all day, even though we were there for the peak. Um, whereas a lot of years, it's pretty easy to just glass up two's gear throughout or the a day. a white streak just going all over. And all over the place. And fighting and they bounce yeah. like rabbits through the desert. And yeah. Yeah. You, you're, you can't not see them rutting. Yeah. Yeah. This year was. And, and then this year, you know, we followed. I was really excited to get down there this year because of the fact that their monsoon season was incredible. Like the water tanks were full, you know, the grasses were tall. Now that can be good or bad, but it was going to be more of your typical year. Like we've seen in the past. Um, I wasn't able to get down, but it sounds like the rut was definitely much more prolific than it was last year where there was no grasses. No, just the nutrition was, it was be- just the growth. The antler growth was better uh across yeah. the board but yeah. but it was full moon like hardcore bright like daytime at night That's and brutal. i just we did not see the crazy white tail coos deer type rutting you normally see yeah. it's like they reserve that for nighttime so what you saw was briefly in the morning at first light you'd see a big giant buck just bedded next to his doe you mm. know obviously they had rutted all night you know so he yes. just bedded next to her he just shifted every few hundred yards bedded with her while she ate all morning and then they would tuck in and bed for the day and mm. that was your moment if you didn't see one in the morning you're kind of you're not good luck finding a mature coos deer throughout the day when they don't get up and they don't rut and then yeah. at night they'd come out and do a little bit of chasing just before dark, but you're up against, I mean, it's late, 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 late by the time they get up and start moving. So it was tough conditions uh, to, to, to the rut wasn't that great. Cause I think the full moon killed it. Mm-hmm. And on the, on the mule deer side of things, you know, we found a handful of muleys, but um, the thing with Arizona and mule deer on this over the counter public land stuff is, you know, it's just, there's so many people chasing the mule deer. Like we had, we had Boone and Crockett coos deer to ourselves, Pope and young, you know, it, old age class stud coos deer to ourselves. Yeah. We really didn't have to contend with other hunters stepping on our toes. So you could yeah. watch and pattern a buck for a day or two. You could get on a buck and wait for it to stand up all day. The mule deer hunts every time we found a stud. So did six other people. And they just would run in and blow it up. They just yeah. run it. Yeah. And it's, it's the oddest thing. And I still can't wrap my head around it. I know uh, Jim Heffelfinger down there has tried explaining ideas on, you know, why you get that inversion of mule deers are in the flats. White tail are actually up on the hill. doesn't make sense to me. It's totally opposite <laughs> here. Uh, but that's what makes those coos deer on there. So cool is they, they literally act like a mule deer and those mule deer um, just bebop around in the flats where they're visible. It's easy travel. Um, you know, guys can get around on, you know, four by fours and trucks and motorcycles and get to these places where the mule deer are. So it's my, way more attractive and that. Yeah. I feel like they're seeing them. So they're stalking them. Um, Correct. I'm not going to say, I'm not going to go as far to say that mule deer are easier to stalk, but um, no, I mean, they, they're different. They present different challenges. You know, usually I can get on a white tail, a coos deer yeah. buck and a doe singled out by themselves on a mountain. Yeah. Uh, every giant buck we saw had 30 or 40 uh, giant mule deer buck had 30, 30 plus does with it. You know, so you're not, you're not getting that buck, you know, generally it's harder to get that buck alone uh, separated from the herd at least during this rut phase that we have this tag and because of the full moon i think again they're pretty satiated all night they're resting during the day but the other thing this year that would blow your mind ryan was we're used to we had a couple of wet years that we hunted there where it was decent Mm-hmm. But nothing like what, what what I experienced this year. Not 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 even close. Like this year was. That's what you were saying. Water everywhere. I'm huh? just water. Everywhere. Yeah, water everywhere. Every every little cut, drainage hole had 
water in it. It was cool yeah. and wet and all the washes. There was water just seeping up in the, you know, the washes are normally dry. Well, there's just like some underground riverbed right there and the rock is all wet, but it's not flowing on the surface. And um, you kick into the dirt and it would fill up with water. And so that whole thing was very different seeing the, um, you know, so when these mule deer in the flats would hit a wash, those washes were so dense and thick they, you know, they can disappear in a wash in years past, but, the, but, the, but this year was, I mean, once they went into a wash, they could be, you could have hundreds of deer in there and you would never see them or be able to right. track them. Uh, it was Gosh. just dense. And that's the big disadvantage on a high water year because even with just the yellow grass, I mean, those deer are so small, they, they disappear on you. Um, you could be glassing them up on a wide open hillside. They lay down, they disappear. So if you don't have Especially, your... Your knocker is like locked the, into place. You don't know where he is. Especially the coos deer, because we got on the coos deer. I think we didn't glass up coos deer in certain areas, not because they weren't there, because we couldn't see them. Yeah, because the vegetation is too tall. Right, right. There, there. You had to get at a certain angle on the mountain, and you had to like really angle just right. So mm-hmm. I don't know. It was it was still yeah. a really fun hunt, and it was a testament to me. You know, Ryan and Brian, Brad and I had our stockasins on and we got in close. We got in close on some very, very mature coos deer bucks, big bucks. And, you know, people say, you know, there are guys you're like, ah, it's too hard. It's too hard. No, it's totally doable. We we had three or four days in a row. We're in bow range. It was an awesome hunt. You can't ask for more except for, you know, finally putting the arrow in one. But, but I just... I just love those little diminutive little guys. I love chasing those things. It is like no accomplishment in the world uh, bigger than arrowing a, a coos deer. <laughs> so you and I have, have uh, been pretty fortunate to, you know, get opportunities to arrow a couple. But yeah, I um, I can't wait to get back down there. But like you said before, I think, uh, you know, there's so many people that that hear about the elusive coos deer and they go down and they, they spend a few days actually on the mountain chasing them, glassing them up, maybe a couple stocks. And it's, it's real quick that you figure out like, man, this is some, this is about as tough as it gets. Like this is not easy to do. So a lot of people do tend to migrate down to those flats and chase those mule deer because it's, uh, it's just different. Well, and it's it just on- way different. And, and those coups, I mean, where they live, uh, with the brush and the noise and the, um, you know, that every tree is a little bit, it's just loud, man. It's just louder down there <laughs> yeah, in that desert. It so tough to yeah. get in without noise from uh, wind or something. I mean, I loved it. I loved glassing up the big bucks and watching them bed and then putting the stock on them. And did you guys have the advantage of like jet noise this year? Like were you guys racing in on bucks when a jet goes overhead and stuff like yes. that? Like, Yep. When that, when that happens, we'd wait for that or you wait for like the thermals would switch in the afternoon and you knew that it would kick up some heavy winds for about an hour or so. Mm -hmm. So you just sat there 200 yards out from the buck or what 150 and you wait and then the wind would just pick up and then you make your move in. And, um, the other thing was there were one of the biggest bucks that we chased was, was right on the the old gravel road and so side by sides were just cruising up and down the road and so mm. you could make your move on the buck he was he was 70 <laughs> yards from the road bedded giant bedded just watching just letting mm. trucks drive by he'd stand up and he'd feed and he'd look around and he'd hear a giant he'd hear a truck come and he'd bed down bed down and then nah. when the truck was gone he'd stand back up so these things are hard to spot if we didn't see him right at first light you weren't going to see him and he was under your nose you know you're literally the second time he bedded he was 60 yards from the road on a different road he he had uh re-bedded and they were right next to the road giant giant coos deer and people drove hundreds hundreds of people drove up and down the roads and so i made my move on him throughout the day when a car, when a, when a side-by-side or a truck was driving by 
and yeah. they'd, they'd perk their ears up and listen every time a truck came by and it would cover my noise as I moved in. I just moved slower than slow, just inch yeah. by inch. It's, it, it's, it's funny because we've seen that every year too. Yeah. I mean, there's some of the better bucks that we laid eyes on are right next to the road. Like, and yet they're not, they're not killed every year. Um, and we've seen guys in the, in the mule deer flats, like standing on a bumper of a truck and they, they kind of like hop off in route and they never stop the truck. And that's how they get in tight to the, to the buck that's bedded by the road. It's a weird tactic, but it works. So yeah, yeah it's, it's always interesting down there. Cause it's not, it's not what you and I usually do when we're up here, anything in this, this north country um we're not by roads we're not hearing truck noise and side-by-side noise but down there it can be a benefit no doubt yeah. about it because they're buzzing all over the place you know it's, i think it's a really we have some footage uh brad it's educational you know i'm filming and you can see brad sliding butt crawling on his butt you know getting in super tight myself as well um what you see is you know just this methodical slow movements only when the wind blows or yeah. you have cover noise do you make those moves uh sometimes you have to wait hours for more wind to kick up later in the yeah. day uh, but in the desert in, in unless it was like last year where it's really stale normally you know if there's any clouds in the sky at all you're going to get some some kick ups, you know, here and there. And that's when you make your move and you just hope that you have enough time, but you know, when you're moving so slow, it looks like you're not moving, then you're yeah. doing it right. And it's very sloth like, yeah, for sure. And it I can mean, they're be gonna, done. Yeah, it can be done. I think, uh, you know, we talk about patience kills the buck and you hear that, that line all the time with mule deer, um, can't be more true than with, those little coups down there because yeah, like we're talking, I mean, you gotta be patient just to get your, 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 some type of a noise cover so you can get in tight. Right. Um, sometimes it's just that sometimes waiting just... for the jet to go by. I mean, how many places have you hunted where <laughs> you have to wait for a jet to go by to, <laughs> to move another 20 yards? It's really odd, but it's effective. And that, that's when it can catch you in the butt too, because when you're moving like a, a snail, the one thing I noticed, especially with the mule deer is um, let's say you're coming over a ridge or around a ridge coming down on top of some bucks and does that are bedded and whatnot. You can move through the grass in the wide open and they'll, they'll not see you up there in the tall grass, just inching your way down into position. Um, and if you move slow and only when there's sound, you can, you can move in pretty close you know, you can get yourself there, but when you get a jet flying over, you can close 15 yards without making noise. Yeah. The, the problem is, um, you know, visual, they movement. see the movement. Yeah. Yeah. So you gotta, you gotta temper it and you can only go so far so fast. One of the things that I realized, um, with, with mule deer is especially when they're running, if they see, if you're below the grass level, mm. you know, like you're on your hands and knees or you're on your stomach or on your butt, you're, you're crab crawling or butt crawling down or whatever, they'll see you, they'll spot you at times. They will not run away. If you're not a, generally they'll get a little nervous or they'll look at you for a while or they're repositioned 30 yards further or 50 yards around the corner. But Mule deer have been incredibly, this is between last year and this year, incredibly tolerant of seeing something in the bushes, some kind of movement, so long as it's not a, it's not a standing human silhouette, mm -hmm. you know, if it's a crawling on your hands and knees silhouette, if it's, if it's a, a, a movement below the grass line and they look at you and they see you, it's like, eh, it's like, they don't, they're like a coyote, a mountain lion, you know, so. You know, uh, I mean, for, it could be a javelina. I mean, the javelina yeah. are everywhere. They seem very tolerant. Uh, so one of my rules is when I'm getting in close, like say I'm 250 yards from these deer, a lot of guys will want to stalk in on their feet mm -hmm. and keep closing the distance, right? Until they're within 150 and then they'll get lower. The problem is 
you don't know what's what lone doe or what lone critter is out there or coos deer bedded behind some bush that might see you at the 250 yard mark. Mm. And really, this is a beautiful opportunity. Your buck is bedded where it needs to be. So is your doe. It looks clear as far as you can tell, but you don't know. I've learned that if I just butt crawl or get on my hands and knees or my belly and I just do that hundred yards, when I do spook a coos deer or some other critter that's there, they get up. Mostly, if you're coos deer, kind of hosed. But if it's a mule deer yeah. or a javelino or something, they'll typically like, eh, I don't like that. And they'll just meander off. They'll just go away. If you're standing on your feet, you're just done. You're done. Yeah, you're done. They it. look over at you. They see you. You're done. There's no, there's no tolerance for it. So yeah. that's just one of one of the, the, you know, just a case for getting low on a yeah. stock, even when you're far away. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're hundred percent on that with mule deer down in those flats. Like you said, there's javelina running all over the place and they see that stuff all the time. Um, I think with the, the tininess of those coos deer, like how tiny they are when any bobcat can get them. Um, I didn't realize like until last year, it's, I don't remember the date is late January. Um, you were there still, you're still down there. Mm -hmm. Uh, we had a big snow. If you'll remember in Arizona, like a big snow, it That's felt like the buck I, killed I was back started. home in Montana. Yeah. It started to rut actually for the first yeah, time. Yeah. It kicked everything weeks. off and we're, and we're late January. Um, hardly any rut at all. And then we had, yeah, we must've got four or five inches of snow in the Sonora of Arizona. It's just not something they see very often. And I was up on a glass and perch and, um, and I saw two bobcats. If you remember, I, I told you about those bobcats I saw. Mm -hmm. And the only reason I saw them because there's a blanket of snow everywhere. And they were chasing coos deer right behind me. And um, I realized, well, you know, I'm not seeing those bobcats when the snow's not there. They're just so small and they're in the grass. You're not seeing them. But I feel like that's why we're, that's why we're having such a struggle with these coos. They're always getting chased by little cats. Yeah. And, and I feel like there's probably a lot of them and, and to get one blanket of snow and for me to immediately pick up two of them, it tells me they're probably just getting hammered by those, those bobcats. So they don't, they don't let movement go unnoticed. Like they, right. they see it. And like you said, sometimes mule deer, yeah, they will focus on it for a little bit, maybe walk the other way. But when it comes to the coos and it doesn't matter, those bucks, they're all the same. They see movement, gig is up for the most part. Like they're either going to sprint out of there, trot out of there. They're leaving. They're out of there. <laughs> so yeah, They're just going to leave and they're not going to yeah. leave to another strikeable location. Generally, they're right. going to run way up far away. Yeah. Sometimes they, you know, you can keep eyes on them. If you're lucky, if you got a guy really high as overwatch, mm -hmm. you know, keeping an eye on them then yeah. uh, that guy might be able to track them because because that's another strategy that, that we use as you get to the highest point you can get to and then yeah. you can see everything. And then when a deer does relocate from this mountain all the way around down a canyon and up and over onto the next, well, that, 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 that vantage point allowed you to track it all the way to the new spot, mm -hmm. you know, and then yeah. there is that opportunity to, to put on another stock on the same deer, which is what happened to me. Yeah. Um, yeah, wouldn't it be so much easier if uh, Brian Call could just climb a tree and um, sit there all day and wait for him to come to him? I'll tell you what. It's, I'll tell you this. Like, you've done that, but there's not many trees down in Arizona that allow for that type no. of hunting. But I got to wonder, like, there's some mountain saddles I came on this year where we saw mm -hmm. those booners walk back and forth multiple times. I think not, that's huge. Not right. just those Boone and Crockett bucks, but a whole bunch of, like, nice mid-sized coos chasing does. And that mountain saddle was so heavily used. And then a couple others where the Okatia is thick and they come out mm. of the Okatia and through a saddle. They just love to be in those Okatia ridges and those Okatia draws. They just, yeah. they're just, I just see giant. I just see big coos in Okatia. Yeah. Um, all the time. 
yeah. all the time. You find a patch well, of Ogatia and it seems like they want to be there. In the saddle trick, I mean, that's how I got my buck last year. You know, I was sitting back and watching a mountainside, just watching the whole hillside. Yeah. And there was a lot of activity there. And I'd seen this buck before, but um, you watch them long enough and they do, it's not a definite pattern, but there's areas that they travel. And saddles are always going to be for most animals, muleys, elk, you know, deer, mountains. Saddles are just always going to be the the uh, the path that they typically take when when moving. So I had seen them on multiple occasions. This buck chasing a doe or hiking after he's done looking at a doe, going back through this this little saddle, and that's ultimately where I ended up. Was um, it was just a perfect little saddle. There's a lot of okatia around, and there was a couple of big boulders, and I was able to position myself in that saddle and. And, um, that was really, I felt like my only shot at getting that buck was, um, having him come to me yeah. and walk to me in that saddle. And it worked. That's where I was looking at this saddle, Brad, we, we figured that out, you know, and, and so Brad moved in on this big old giant, uh, and he got into the saddle where the wind's in his face on the, on the, just on the upper side, it was about a you know, depending on where he crossed in the saddle, anywhere between 20 and, you know, 70 yard shot in there. And, you know, and, uh, he had multiple bucks come through lots of does come through. He could have shot. That's one thing about this year is we could have shot coos deer. Uh, we could have shot mule deer. Uh, I had younger deer in range. If I just wanted to fill my tag, I could have done that, but I really wanted to, get that bigger buck and brad actually got on on uh got close to shooting uh, i think it was a three by three buck but i was i was but there was a big old stud there that would just walk through that saddle not too long before and i'm like he might come right back so i was proud of brad when he didn't let it fly you know and, (laughs) and, and smoke that buck holding out for the bigger older buck but any coos deer with a bow is oh, yeah. an accomplishment, but I yeah. guess, you know, I just, I'm so excited about putting my hands on one of those just true giants that was I was troll. glad, but that saddle was magic. But here's the thing in that tall grass, you know, it's, it's like finding a spot to get your bow back and drawn yeah. is tricky. <clears throat> and uh, so when I was in some of the, some other areas, I saw a bunch of ground blinds. This is for all the mule deer stuff and water holes. And I have now I'm wondering, you know, if a ground blind on a mountain saddle wouldn't be devastating because think about how quiet it would be, you know, the ground inside there, your, you, your movement is concealed. Yeah. Movement. You can draw that bow in the shadows. They don't see it. There's just so much with a coos deer that makes it, makes sense but you'd have as to make boring sure as, as boring as that sounds it sounds like sitting on a water hole or a tree stand to me there is no doubt that if you position that ground blind in a saddle where they're moving back and forth that's probably going to be your best odds i well, think honestly I, I thought about it and i thought well we could have shot multiple bucks out of a blind if it was right there just yeah. with the number of large bucks that would chase off the last large buck or just the amount of traffic going in and out of that saddle. The wind always blew uphill. One thing about this year that was really crazy was the wind patterns were, and this is true on any high mountain hunt generally. You can rely on the wind a lot more, you know, at least uh, two thirds of the way up. You know, on the top, it might get a little squirrely, but, sure. but, but two thirds up you're not at the bottom. You're not at the top. Like that magic, the wind just blows uphill so hard all day. And in Arizona, it was like it all day, every day, Mm. even as as the thermal switched in the evening, it still blew uphill up up, up there. And some of these mountains we're hunting are, you know, they're high They're They, 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 you're, you got these flat deserts, but up there on those tops, it just, it's it's some kind of directional. It just goes. And Mm -hmm. so to sit there, you could sit there, the wind's always good almost. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's just not being seen and being able to get a draw full draw. But 
Yeah, I, I think know. a professional whitetail hunter would probably take advantage <laughs> of saddles and, and ground blinds. Uh, I feel like that would be the ultimate tactic. Well, and um, I feel like they're aggressive too. So a little grunt tube here and there, like when yeah, Buck's sure. got his head turned around, it, it w- I wouldn't be surprised if it brought one near the blind or whatever. But the problem yeah. with with that, and and I saw this with some hunting public film a couple of years ago, they would grunt. But good luck getting that full draw. I mean, that deer came right to the grunt. And as soon as they bobbed an ear or twitched an eyeball, they they were out. You know, I mean, yeah, not easy. So I don't know. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I I sure wish, like, heck, I could have got down there this year. I fully expected to. Um, I almost got a kawadi. Just a hunt. Yeah, no, another year with no kawadi. Gosh dang. I saw one saw one like mm. in the old days through the yellow grass because there's a lot of it that tail just the tail up in the air and then it yeah. went from tree to tree to tree through the grass it just looked like a little little uh monkey and then he magically disappeared in the he hole did i don't know where here. he went i yeah. i grabbed the two two three and i'm like <laughs> where'd he go but it's uh, too late but yeah. we got a couple coyotes did you yeah you guys did the brad gorgeous. call him in or did he you guys no, just we them. just happened to see them, and they yeah. stood there for the shot. Mm. Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah. yeah, I noticed, uh, you know, as as we dealt with COVID rolling through the house here, and you guys are down there having fun in the <laughs> in the warm state, um, you know, I paid attention to what was going on. And like every year, it feels like it's fun to kind of see how guys are doing down there. Um, I know some everybody seemed to struggle as, as usual with the coos deer. It's just, it's never going to be an easy hunt. Um, but man, I tell you, looking at folks that did have the luxury of going to the other side and hit the Mexico side, I don't know that I've never seen so many large bucks taken. Um, and I think like you and I, we assume that's probably because maybe get a little more traffic, but also the, the, the conditions they had, the feed they had this year versus the, last Weather few years feed, was yeah. off the chart but some legit like 110 to 120 plus inch bucks coming out of mexico this year so some freaks they, man yeah. i mean on the mule deer side too uh and i i makes me rethink the possibility of hunting mexico you know well and here's the thing like you and i will see a buck or two in that caliber every year right you guys saw some some big old pigs um our side we have a bow in our hand the other side they have a rifle in their hand so there's a little bit of difference um no doubt about it but we were we had a radio not like we don't yeah it's not like we don't have those giants on our side um but man are they tough (laughs) it's just so we saw one cross the border and come Mm. right onto our side that was how big was that brad like one 120 plus who's deer look like a moose fully bladed Mm. he but he he came across he's just giant just just a freak of of a coos and then he just disappeared in the tall grass never saw him again yeah Yeah. he's just rutting up the wash and just gone it's like how do you hunt him it was a flat there's Mm. no especially with the conditions the way they are this year. And my daughters were driving around the, the Ranger, the side by side, and we were hanging out in camp and we were, you know, staying in radio contact, you know, with everyone and often didn't have service, but we, we could hear everybody and we'd get on the same channel as a bunch of people in Mexico Mm. and you could hear him. He's like, it's 200 yards and that that is a 120 plus that is a giant coos deer dude and da, da, da. oh god and they'd shoot four bucks and we're just hearing them on our channel they shoot four bucks in in a day in the in mm. the in the booner class and you're just like huh mexico sounds fun <laughs> yeah no kidding yeah i i know uh, a lot more people that, i mean i'm not too i haven't been tuned in too much to that hunt down there but i guess maybe just lately i've noticed it more um a lot of guys are grabbing onto it and crushing the giants there's there's uh every year though ryan um i think we've been able to find 110 inch 100 inch 110 and sometimes bigger 
uh, coups bucks on on the U.S. side. Yeah, and especially during, you know, I I don't know when I look because I've been considering using getting rifle points to hunt m- big old coups in, in Arizona December. in December. Yep. but it's not the rut and observing this giant buck that I was trying to kill this year, seeing him lay down when the trucks come stand up when they leave and desperate to stay close to this doe, but, but he'd keep her in her, his sights, but he would hide her bed down or lay down. And when he bedded, he bedded, he burrowed into a, mm. a mesquite tree hole uh in 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 so deep and uh the coos doe that was with him she was buried deep into this i mean they have to like really shimmy into this thick thick nasty chunk and then there's like a little nest in there and mm-hmm. that doe is bedded against the trunk of the tree and she's laying around and flipping and pretty soon she's on her back and her, she's got all four legs in the air and she's just like rolling and she's just sitting there like like a bear, not like a mm. deer at all. Like you rarely see deer do anything like that. And it's just like, she's in a nest in this thick, thick cover completely laid out. And you know, mm. the buck is next to her. And I, I was looking at that going, you know, if that buck stays in that hole all day long, you're never going to spot mm. him. And yeah. if he only comes out at night, you're not going to kill that deer except for when during the rut archery. So the deva- the advantage in let's say Mexico is they got guns over there during the rut. During the rut, yeah. So they're yeah. getting to get on these bucks. I don't know how useful it is for me to use my points, you know, and and get a rifle tag for for Arizona to hunt coos deer. I think it could be fun, but when I see when I see a 115 20 inch buck that I want to go after with a bow and I'm only going to see, uh, you know, a 70 or 80 inch buck with a rifle in hand. I, I don't know if that hunt's worth it is all I'm saying. I don't know if that's what I want to do. Now, the great thing about Arizona is you could use those points. You could go on that rifle hunt. If you don't, if you, you can have more than one deer tag at a time in Arizona. So I can still buy my over the counter tag. And if I don't shoot something with a rifle, no loss, I can still do my, my archery hunt. You roll right into January and chase him with your butt. The only thing is, is I could use my archery points for a decent mule deer hunt in Arizona instead, Mm -hmm. like for an archery mule deer type experience. Right. So there's decisions to be made there. I don't know what to do. (laughs) I kind of want to try a rifle, an Arizona rifle coos hunt. It's, Mm -hmm. it's, it'd just be so exciting. If you could, I, I do believe like I watched. I do feel like my glassing skills and my patience and, and, and all of that are on a higher level than a lot of hunters just because of the, the sheer time I've been able to spend in the field. And, uh, I do think if anybody could pick one up, I could do it, or you could do it, uh, you know, pick up a giant during that December period when you got a rifle in hand, yeah. even though it's not a rut. So it does, it does interest me for that challenge, you know, um, it's a challenge. I, there's nothing easy about it. That's for sure. Cause like you say, it's, it's not during the rut and we know people down there that do that and, uh, they're definitely not successful every year. And when they are, um, I haven't noticed that they're taking giant bucks. They're taking any buck. Um, I haven't seen now they, obviously I'm sure they do some guys do take some giants during that December hunt, but the bucks that I'm seeing from some of those locals that do hunt it with a rifle, they're not the jaw dropping booners that, and that we've seen chasing, uh, chasing them in January come that rut season. It's just like everything else. The big ones come out play during the rut. That's what I told Brad. We were having a long conversation on one of those desert afternoons. And I was like, these bucks we're seeing during the rut with our bow in hand are another class compared to what I'm seeing guys on rifle yeah. coos deer hunts are seeing. They're just yeah. they're just another level of critter with the mass, the bladed 
you know, six inch eye guards, the, the bladed massive, yeah. like moose, uh, like palmated racks. And you're just like, I'm not seeing that those kind of deer being seen very often on a coos deer hunt. Now it happens on occasion. Chris mm-hmm. Denham, I've seen him put some on film, but not actually kill one, you know, on some of those, those same hunts. But I, I think, you know, the, I think it, you know, of course it could be done. Of course. Yeah, I've seen like one of the most impressive. I remember Nawatney went down there. It's been years, but he got a great one with his bow years ago down there. Um, it was one of those old troll. You know, you step back, it looks like a little rack, but you get close, it's like heavy and bladed and trash, and they're just so cool to look at up close. Um, and he took it just at stud coos with his bow. Um, this is definitely a rare case that you number one find a buck of that caliber and number two be able to get in on it with a bow but. that's that's addictive i mean it is kind of you know i i'm see ultimate challenge brian the <laughs> ultimate challenge who's doing the book i think i do feel though that um when it comes to i'm pretty much i am not species um biased necessarily Mm. Uh, I am very open-minded about whether I kill a, a mule deer <laughs> and a white tail, a coos deer, um, you know, I am extremely, extremely open-minded about, I have no preference on the species, but I am an absolute bigot when it comes to age and class, <laughs> like size, like, <laughs> I am, yeah. I only want to kill them if they're big or I want to not punch my tag. And it didn't, yeah. I didn't used to be that way. I used to be a mm. lot but now it's like we were hunting with cal this year when you put a few down yeah you you just kind of want to you want a new challenge you want a little bit smarter older age class well i i feel like i kind of want to let i don't feel the need to fill a tag every year anymore Mm -hmm. you know i i've done it uh, my share and if i have a freezer that's full i kind of i kind of actually enjoy letting something walk like eh, yeah you know, I'm looking back at some of the footage we got this year. You know, I'm looking at that narrow buck that's heavy and that we have some film of. It's on our yeah. locals platform. So if people want to watch, you know, Mule Deer series, we have one Again, over there. If you haven't seen it, Brian passed on a, a really nice heavy brow tine type buck. So <laughs> Yeah, I agree. Was, I'm sure he was kicking himself on day 10. Well, I am looking at it at <laughs> home and I'm like, that's that's actually a pretty nice buck. You know, he is yeah. narrow. But he's I'm unique like, because of his uh what did what did cal say he's like he's, he's as white as his eyes he's outside his eyes <laughs> <laughs> like but yeah but let's face the facts that buck had something going for him because we watched him chase off a giant buck like a really nice the big frame buck that we called him um that buck had age to him but he he had a real thin comp we called him the compact buck but he was heavy uh good body size to him and all that he had something i think he probably would have been better than we thought if we would have got up close to him actually uh taken yeah i think so i i've looked at the footage a lot more once you get home and i'm like he's bigger but he's bigger than i thought yeah. even even out there but at the same time you know the book buck you shot is a is a giant and <laughs> when i look at that it's like uh you know there's a potential there's still days you know to find a buck like that and uh the idea of keeping my tag and being able to still get an animal like that while there's still time is more exciting than taking the buck it didn't used to be i would have been really stoked to have a buck like like the compact buck years ago but you evolve and you change and and you know where i'm at right now i would much rather just see if we see that buck again next year, which was another question I had for you um, talking deer and mule deer and old bucks. Um, We've come across people who have, who have come across the same buck multiple years in a row, Uh, even brow tine buck. We had heard about people who had seen him and passed him and seen him and passed him or or whatever, because they were fooled just like we were. So it wasn't like, Oh yeah, (laughs) Yeah, for sure. Um, And so, but then there are bucks where you and I have been there and we've returned to areas we've hunted in the past, hoping to find 
a buck that we had seen at least one out of the four studs we saw the year before and never took yeah. come back and we see a whole different group of four studs and come back and different group. like why why am i not seeing like like do you think we'll ever see this narrow buck again do you think some of these deer you'll ever see twice because uh, i'm not seeing that i expect i would but i haven't seen it yeah no it's interesting and it blows you away that you don't sometimes because some of these areas that that we'll go back to are fairly small um now we've we've proven it can be done with bears we've proven it can be done with certain deer in certain places you know oftentimes i think it's just the area you're in you know the the point in which the migration is either passed or hasn't gotten there yet um you know and a lot of that is dictated by weather snow um season dates the season dates yeah all those things you know I think we would be more likely if we were to hunt this closer to a winter range. Um, I think a lot of times, mm. my opinion is more times than not, they'll come back down to the general area where they've wintered before in the past. If we were more down on a winter range and we saw compact buck down there, you know, we're still quite a ways off from the winter range where we're hunting. Um, I feel like we got a better chance down there. Now we're, we're kind of at the, the top of the drainage, right? We're, we've, we've found a soft spot at the top of the mountain, literally within eyesight of summer range. So we're not too far off the top. And I think there's just a, there's a big window there, like where they could be. And so, um, you know, who knows where compact, buck summer's at maybe it's what we're looking at maybe it's three giant mountains over um and and we're just not seeing them in that those october dates but if we were hunting that second week in november or third week in november i think there's a much like you know higher likelihood that we would pick that buck that same buck up again because yeah you're right we we've hunted areas where we hope like heck like we've we've passed on bucks that are like right on the fringe of being fantastic. And, um, and then you go back and you really hope that you see that buck a year later uh, on a, a better growth year or whatever it is. And yeah, there's certain areas where it happens. And I think the area that we've picked up, yeah, like that buck, you're, <laughs> that shed you're holding right now. I mean, that's a buck that we were hoping to relocate. Look at that. Look at we that haven't blade. seen him. And yeah. Just, just everything about this this buck is is what I want to find. Now, and if we, I think if we get, if we magically hit a year where the weather is so intense and it brings everything off the top, there's yeah. a good chance we'll find that buck. You know, mm -hmm. um, which that came a little closer to the uh, winter range there. So for sure, yeah, a lot of it has to do with conditions out of our control. Um, more likely with big weather. Mm -hmm. The migration stuff has been fascinating as I've done archery hunts in migration corridors, closer to winter range, up higher in mountains, rifle hunts, you know, some, you know, some in the dead heat of set of November, some later versus a hunt uh, like Arizona, for example, coos deer where I think those bucks just stay in the same exact spot all year round and barely go. Yeah. Barely go more than a mile in each direction. It's like, right. they know they're in. Yeah. No migration. The migration stuff is fascinating because it's a, uh, it's a different game altogether. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, Kind of. And, 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 and it makes it really tough when you're limited with your dates. You know, there's every state is a little bit different. You know, my state here in Montana, I mean, they, it, it's, it's odd that we still have mule deer in the state that grow to be of any age because for as long as I can remember, they let us hunt with a rifle all the way through the end of November, <laughs> through the rut, and they have forever. Yeah. I mean, they give us five weeks of rifle hunt through the entire rut. And we also get to hunt with our bows for six weeks 
before the rut. Yeah. So true. How we have giant bucks um, is beyond me, but we still seem to have it. And then there's states where, you know, you got to grab a controlled hunt um, through the draw process to be able to hunt in November and to be able to hunt the rut at all. Now, what we found, um, you know, I really like the last 10 days of October. Uh, it's definitely the front end, but again, um, there's a little risk. There's a little gamble to it, but October 20th, my birthday every year, I feel like that's the magic day. Like that's the day high country, more Northern, um, States. Yep. Uh, there's mule deer rutting on October 20th every year. And, and we've done pretty well on those last 10 days. Now, if the weather's wrong and it's 70 degrees blazing hot, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. They're just not moving around. You just don't get a, get a see them. They're not, they're not cruising like they do with cooler days and frozen nights. And, but we've had well, brow time. Um, we found him before the 20th of oh, October and so he was rutting, early. He was rutting his head off. Um, and then, you know, but we had a coolness, um, we had some snow up top and we did, and he triggered. And, um, I, I like, I like just hoping and praying that we're going to get the weather, um, during those last 10 days of October, because that is a great time. It can also be a really frustrating time if you don't get that, that weather to help out. So tell me, tell, tell me your strategy. Let's say, let's, let's take two scenarios. One is it's October. It's, it's those last two weeks, like you're talking about your birthday, you know, moving on uh, into the last up to Halloween, right? There's your window. Let's say you're in that window and it's a really cold, 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 the nasty, you know, weather. What's your plan? Finding does. I think because it's after October 20th and, and we've got the weather to uh, kind of chop the top off of that range and they're pushing down, they're going to be moving. Um, they got does on the brain. They're going to come down and get a little sniffy and, and um, kind of place themselves within striking distance of the does at that time, if the weather's right. Okay. And so similar to what we did on our hunt this year, um, we would have hunted very differently if we would have had no snow, we didn't see if we hadn't seen snow coming in the forecast. So that's, that's scenario two. I want to know, let's okay. say there's no snow, it's warm, you yep. know, it's the same period, but it's really not, um, much weather at all. We're in t-shirts in the afternoon. Yeah. Do you do then? I think in that scenario, I am covering miles like, uh, like you read about, like that's where that's going to be one physical hunt. You're trying to cover all those tops, glassing in the rocks, um, getting every minute you can out of those areas and moving a lot. And, and they're not concentrated if that's not, if that's not happening, if you don't have the snow. Now, there's def definitely areas. I mean, Colorado, we're talking about a state um, that is very different than, say, like a, a Colorado above tree line state, you know, very different tactics and scenarios. But where we're hunting, you know, we're, it's timbered, it's rocky. They're hard to find. Uh, they're spread out. It's, it's very, it's, it's not a high deer, deer density area whatsoever. It doesn't become that high density until you chop off a couple thousand feet of that range with some snow. Um, prior to that happening though, um, we are going to be covering a ton of country with our glass, hiking those ridges, um, looking at those open tops, out shoots, stuff like that. Versus, are you dead? Are you generally going high? Yeah. Yep. Top of the top of the heat, in my opinion. Um, that's where I've done best. And and I think back to like a lot of Washington hunts where we were hunting. We weren't allowed to hunt in November, so we're hunting those. October dates and, and even more so we're hunting from like October 11th through the 22nd or somewhere in that range, you know? So, um, we're going, 
to the tip tops. We're looking for openings. We're oftentimes hunting in like the Tamarack uh, type areas in that environment, 6,500 to 7,400 feet of elevation. And low dense, low density areas. And it's, it's just a matter of covering ground, glassing your eyeballs off, spreading out. If you got two, three guys looking in different areas until you find them, um, when you didn't have weather and those can be really tough, tricky hunts. Um, and everything changes and tactics all change when you get the weather, it makes it a lot easier. It's still a patience game, like scenario number two that you wanted to talk about. Um, you see snow in the forecast. You already have some snow in the high country. You can expect that there's going to be a migration. You can expect that they're going to start moving. Um, you know, we like, we like to find those little soft spots that hold the does at that time of year. And, and um, you find the soft spot, you find you know, a handful of does or even better, multiple groups of small groups of does on a, in a drainage and you sit back and you play the patience game and you let those bucks come to you, um, with the expectation of hopefully more weather, yeah, cooler days, frozen nights, things like that. And that's worked really well for us. And that's the um, ideal situation. Yeah. So let's, I, I'm, 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 I'm wanting to know um, a little bit more about your, you know, on this last hunt, if people want to watch the film, you know, I call it the cliff buck. It's, it's a film on uh, gritty.locals.com. It's on our gritty stealthy community page If people go and become a member. It's or a supporter at seven bucks and they get access to this two part series. Cool film yeah. on that film. Um, you, you, you got a giant muley. And one of the things that, uh, and pro- we should probably cover it on a different podcast. We've gone on for quite a while, but I, I do want to cover this subject. Don't let me forget about it where you kill this buck. Um, and it was unique the way that it was looking over its back trail. It was unique in how we bumped it. It was unique in how we waited for, I don't know, an hour, almost two hours, just once we bumped it, we didn't move. We stayed put. I think, I think, um, you know, I want to, I want to get into your brain on why you did that. Cause I think, I think, you know, we, this monster ended up coming home. You ended up tagging him, but I, I think that the patience involved in the strategy, like what goes through your head, the cautiousness that you possess really led to that, that success. So we should talk about that uh, on yeah. the next show because what do you do when when you see a giant like that and you bump it like we did? Because I can think of many times where that's happened and guys just start panicking, yeah, running around, and, and frantic, yeah. and they never see that deer again, you know. Um, and yet, that's not how it played out for us. So you know, we we posted up and played the long game, the patience yeah. game for sure. But yeah, no, we should definitely talk about that. Just how that went down upon first laying eyes on that monster to, uh, to actually get in that shot. I know, think it'll be a beneficial, story. um, you know, you can take a lot from stories. I think you can, you can tell tactics, but a story really helps me remember, mm-hmm. uh, and take in a lesson, you know, more than just, Hey, this is, this is what you do yeah. here. Um, yeah gives it it sticks better um before we end this podcast uh let let, let's talk a little bit about the western hunting summit Mm -hmm. that you have going on for people who want to learn more about hunting out west you've got a killer face-to-face uh event that you're putting on where are you at with that right now yeah so um geez we did our pre-launch back in december and um we talked about it very little, like we didn't, we didn't do a whole lot of talking about it this year. Um, we're just, we're just curious, you know, how popular it'd be. And, and, uh, we had a great pre-launch for it. Um, kind of sells itself, you know, being here in Montana, four days spent, uh, in this place with us, everybody stays on site. We feed everybody every meal. Um, this year, 
is different than last year. We try to keep moving. We change it. We have to change it because we've got so many repeat folks coming back to these things. Like we just can't keep it the same. Like we can't have the same speakers. Right. We can't have the same venue necessarily. Last year we had our event up in the crazy mountains and I don't know that it could have been in a better place. Uh, We were a little bit limited because of course, every year I want to take these guys on a, on a good climb and hike and get some sweat going and stuff like that. And then I want to glass animals. Well, you know, when you do that, like it took us on to the forest service land. So, you know, I, I grab permits for that and it's, it's a little bit limiting as far as um, what you can do, how many people you can take at a time. And they weren't allowing me to do like an overnighter last year on the mountain with the permit. Mm. So that was a little bit of a, a bummer. We still made it work. We had a ton of fun, saw a lot of animals up there glassing. Um, but we had to do it in different stages of people, you know. This year, we've got. Turner's old ranch. So Ted Turner, he's folks tend to know who he is. He owns and has owned a crud ton of land here in Montana. Um, one of his pieces is just north of me, up um, towards Townsend. And it's 20, I think it's 27,000 acres, maybe just under 27,000 acres. And it is um, in some prime elk country. There's a crud ton of bears. There's a crud ton of giant bulls mm-hmm. and uh, a lot of mule deer as well. And so I secured that piece this year. And what's nice about the Turner place is I don't have to do the permit process. Um, I'm not limited. We can do an overnighter again, go back to that, do some big hikes um, as a group, all those things. So this year we're going to be doing a lot more mountain time some of the education pieces with different presenters we're going to do on the mountain versus in a classroom type setting. Um, we got some great entertainment coming in with some music. Uh, we've got, uh, like I said, feeding everybody. We're going to have again, some, some challenges like our 3d shoots. Um, those are always a lot of fun last year. You know, we mix it up last year. I had folks carry weight on their, back weren't able to take their pack off um the entire time is a five mile 3d course and we competed with it and it was just a ton of fun um one of my favorite pieces to the summit and pretty much anyone who's done it wants to go back and do it again i mean that's a testament to the to the course uh yeah every year we event we send surveys out for everybody and great responses what is the uh what classes are still available which which events can they still attend so, like I see every year, um, elk always goes first. <laughs> people people jump onto that elk event, and that's the very first event this year. It's uh, June 9th through the through the thirteenth, ninth uh, through the twelfth, and that's that's uh, that one is right there from being completely sold out. Uh, the next event is the mule deer specific event, and that's uh, the very following four days. So it goes from Thursday to Sunday. That's going to be the 16th through the 19th. Okay. Um, there's still some a few spots there. Uh, so obviously, I'm doing animal specific this year versus uh, weapon specific, like we did last year. Right. Now the last event is is June 23rd through the 26th. And it's a combo event. We're going to have speakers talking about elk, deer, um, both weapon types. And uh, that's a a family friendly, encouraging people to bring their kids. Uh, We're going to have folks there to entertain the kids, teach them shooting, all the things, do a bunch of fun little activities. So, you know, the adults can go off and we can do our thing and the kids can you know, be down at the, at the bottom there on their own hikes and own events, but most likely some of those kids are want to come, going to want to come with us as well. Um, and where do is, where do people, where do people find, uh, the links and stuff to, to sign up? Yeah. Just go to Western hunting summit.com and you will find all things summit okay. on the site there. Cool. Western hunting yeah. And then, uh, yeah. Anybody that's listening that enjoys the show, 
Uh, you can support the show by getting yourself a swanky, stylish, stealthy hunter rifle cover and <laughs> glassing pad. Uh, do you have any of those in stock? Because you had yeah. some new colors I saw the other day. Um, yeah, we keep adding colors. So we got four colors now on those uh, rifle covers. Yeah, yeah. We've got the coyote, the ranger, the the black, and the and the wolf gray there. So and then yep. Use the code. The uh, use the code gritty. Yeah, Get yourself a little Absolutely. savings. So save yourself um, some cash. Yeah. And then, uh, as always, you can check out the supplements with Stealthy as well. Use the code Gritty there. Mm -hmm. And then um, another great uh, way to support us is with Peaks. If you got the need for some gators and some poles, absolutely. Uh, use the code Gritty for that. That's that's awesome. Um, and right now, I've got a code with Black Ovis, which kind of covers the gamut. So if you want some backpacking food like peak refuel some darn tough socks you know uh i don't know grab them there over rei folks no yeah doubt about a mini mo uh little it's stove really that we've been pushing for years go get it a black ovis and use the code gritty uh because that supports us especially that backpack gear that can only be got at like a rei type store or a cabela's send that over to black Ovis where it's a bunch of hunters and yep. uh, use the code gritty. And that really does help help my channel out. So dude, I think that's it. I think we just need to get uh, back on this train though. I'd love to get, pick your brain a little more and get more podcast content out. Cause yeah, we tickled the mule deer topic a little bit, but yeah. I think we could get a little deeper next time. So absolutely. Thanks man. Appreciate you coming on and folks, thanks for tuning in. Stay gritty.